One of the big challenges that you will often hear talked about around the low carbon energy transition is what happens when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. Well, it is a good question. And over the last uh, month or so in November, we've experienced just that still cloudy weather that some people term as Dunkenflaut, which is a German word that roughly means dark doldrums, or more helpfully in the renewable energy sector, a period of time in which little or no energy can be generated with wind and solar. So opponents of the energy transition will use weeks like this to show that a low carbon future isn't possible or prove how naive climate activists really are. Well, the challenge then in reply to that is, of course, this is a problem, but it's a problem with a plan. So let's talk through what ha what's happened to our grid this month to mean we've kept the lights on and what does it mean for the future when we will need to have and will have more renewables? Because we need low carbon electricity to power our lives today already and to power heat pumps, electric vehicles and electrified industry in the future. So let's start with what happens during a couple of weeks of dark doldrums for a specific wind turbine in southwest Scotland. You see, we are members of one of the Ripple Energy cooperatives. We've invested in a huge 343 watts of a wind farm in Scotland at the Kirkwill, Kirkhill Wind Farm. And through our membership, we get information in a dashboard about the performance of the wind farm and therefore the generation attributed to our investment and to us and the savings attributed to us. So as you can see from the generation data, we haven't generated much this month. Octa October was obviously much windier. So far in November, the blades on our wind turbine must have been spinning much more slowly. And as of the 24th of November and Storm Bert, we see some generation again, but not much up to that point. And the key thing to remember is that we have a variety of energy sources in the UK in a variety of locations. And luckily, that one wind farm is not responsible for all electricity generation. So where does all our electricity come from? How have we kept the lights on this month with so much reliance on wind already on the UK grid? Well, my pal Andrew Crossland is a professor in practice at Durham University. He's also been running the fantastic website MyGridGB for around the last 10 years. MyGridGB G, my grid GB documents the sources of electricity on the GB grid every day. And as we've moved away from coal, it's been fantastic to watch the days of zero coal generation tot up and see the times where we have very low emissions electricity supply in the UK already. I used to be a bit obsessed with this website, uh, visiting it every day, refreshing it hour by hour to see what had changed. I'm definitely a low carbon nerd. But you can see on the graph of the last 28 days, uh, the drop in wind generation and the increase in the amounts of gas. And this is okay for now. We can still use that fossil power, although it would be better if we weren't doing so. But in the future, we cannot rely on gas. So what is the plan? Well, already to today, despite the dark doldrums, we didn't rely 100% on gas power stations. Some of our electricity came from nuclear power, some from biomass, which isn't great, um, some hydropower, some imports from elsewhere and storage already on the grid. And there still has been some breeze and some solar generation despite the still weather. So some of our electricity still came from on and offshore wind and some still came from solar power. Over the last 28 days, over 40% of our electricity came from gas. So what would it look like if we wanted to use less gas and have a much lower emissions electricity system? Well, Andrew is pretty good at what he does and he's modeled exactly that. So he's modeled a future electricity system that could be in place to achieve low emissions electricity. Um, his model takes weather data and demand data and estimates what would happen in a real life scenario. So Andrew set the target for 2030 of electricity of less than 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which is what we will call here low emissions electricity. It sometimes isn't clear what government targets are when it comes to decarbonisation of electricity, but 100 grams per kilowatt hour is maybe a helpful target, helpful metric to show what is possible. And I think the government target might be a bit past that, which could be a challenge. But 100 grams is better than where we are today. 
The assumptions in Andrew's model are that in 2030 we'd have uh, 3.2 gigawatts of nuclear uh, of new nuclear power, so Hinkley C, three times the amount of wind generation, three times the amount of solar generation that Andrew sets out as 10 million solar solar homes. Uh, we'd have one and a half times the amount of biomass power and 100 gigawatt hours of storage. Th this sounds like an imperfect scenario, but it's better than today for sure. Uh, and there, there are some, some pragmatic assumptions as to what is achievable. So if the grid looked like that, what would it have been like over the last 28 days? Well, Andrew's model lets us compare the actual mix uh, today with a future scenario. We see a base load of 25% of electricity supplied from nuclear power, 8% from biomass, 45% from wind, despite the still weather, 4% from solar, despite the dark, cloudy weather, 11% still from gas, some storage and some large hydro and some imports. So what do you think to that scenario? Under that scenario, we'd meet that target of less than 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, almost 65% lower than today at 82 grams. Although there are definitely times in that scenario where we are really quite reliant on gas. So to get through some of that dunk and flout, um, maybe Andrew's model is saying that we'll still need gas power stations for several days at a time. But over the whole month, they'd only provide 11% of the electricity that we need. Over a whole year, that would be much, much lower. So would we call this last month in Andrew's scenario a low carbon electricity supply? Is that good enough? Well, yes and no. It's good uh, as it's, it is good because it's much better than it is than we have today. Despite the still weather, we could still keep the lights on and do it with much lower emissions. But no, it's not good enough because there'd still be meaningful emissions linked to electricity. And that's not what the government has signalled is their intention. So what more could happen? Well, the gas power stations that we have in 2030, they could be retrofitted, made with carbon capture, which is imperfect again. Um, we will have a lot more storage than today by 2030, which means we could potentially utilise parked electric vehicle batteries to meet the load when the wind is not blowing as hard. But that feels imperfect too. Um, we, we may well be incentivised to shift when we use power to help the grid minimise demand and how much gas it needs to burn. And that's already happening today through saving sessions or through load shifting and smart tariffs with different rates throughout the day. But it's also imperfect. But with a load of different initiatives together, we can get through the dark doldrums. More generation capacity, yes. More storage, yes. Novel use of storage in electric vehicles. Demand shifting, carbon capture and smart tariffs, all of the above. Imperfect solutions working together to make a much better, albeit still imperfect, future. Okay, what do you think? Next time that someone says to you, well, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, I would encourage you to say, well, yeah, obviously. And we've got a lot of tools to help us get through those times. Just because something is hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do it. And if we don't hit the perfect system in the next five or six years, that's okay. At least it will be better than it is today.